everybody video here for you today we're going to go back to ancient america i know a lot of my ancient america videos come from east of the mississippi but i have covered quite a few sites in the american southwest these are just some of them here and i have some place marks still to put in but we're going to go down to arizona today we're going to get a lecture about a 23 minute talk from an hour video but i thought this was just good history goes well with my ancient america series i have covered a lot of sites in arizona Casa Mel Pius, the buried site of Levia, right in Phoenix, Snake Town, just south of Phoenix, place that goes back, I believe, 1500 BC, ball courts, kind of lost history there. But the area that is going to be gone over in the lecture is just east of Phoenix. There are some ancient ruins down here. This is stuff that I had never really even heard about. But this is one site right down here. It's called Goad Hill, and this is mentioned in the lecture. It's right down here there are ancient ruins on top of a mound right here you can see that right down here perfectly and then right on top of it here there are ancient ruins this is just one of the sites mentioned in the lecture there you can see the circular ruins on top of this mound on top of this hill I just think this is a pretty cool site this is just one of the areas that is talked about in the lecture but it would have overlooked the whole Safford Basin here, and that's what this place is called. A lot of these ruins were lost to farming in the 1800s, 1900s. And this is kind of unknown history. That's why I'm doing it today, but it goes along well with my Ancient America series. We're going to see some ancient canals, some ancient farming techniques, some ancient ball courts. Arizona has some pretty cool ruins. Here is a video I did on ancient Snake Town, just south of Phoenix. The ruins here were excavated, then it's just been kind of buried and lost to history. But there is a ball court located just south of Phoenix, Arizona. I just think the ruins in the American Southwest are pretty fascinating. This is a video I uploaded in 2016 from above images of a storied land. Adriel Heisey gives you a bird's eye view of some of these ruins around Arizona. I think right over the border in California too. But this is stuff we just never ever see and then this is the best way to look at it from up, up above because a lot of these are on high perches i believe that's the blythe and Talios right there but in the lecture coming up the lecture uses some of adriel heisey's photos just because they are so well done there's a look probably an astronomical observatory of some sort remind you of stuff you see in peru but there Village might go back six, seven, eight hundred years. Of course, the serpent is central to mythological stories, creation stories coming from all over North America. There's a look at some more ruins, but I just really like this video. It gives you a good overhead look. And of course, me, myself, well, I like overhead looks. Some of these ruins I've covered on my channel. Some of them I have not. They are pretty unknown. I think they have recorded over a hundred ball courts just in Arizona and they're kind of lost to history but seems to be the northern branch of the Mayans were up here in the southern southwestern United States that's the Blythe Antelios they also have a snake there with a the curled tail that seems to be eating the world but I will leave the full link for this video below here's a video that I'm going to share now I'm going to share over 20 minutes of this this is a 58 minute video from archaeology southwest they make their video shareable Jeff Clark talks about artifacts, talks about ball courts, ancient canals, farming methods. Share some of Adriel Heisey's picks. I just thought this was a good video. This is just ancient American history here coming from the American Southwest. I hope you enjoy it and you all have a very nice day. But we now have uh, the Tucson Basin has been um, um, blessed with a lot of intensive excavation in the floodplain. We now have irrigation agriculture uh, dated in the Tucson Basin to 1200 BC. I just point out uh, these are the canals and you can see these raised borders uh, fields. It's nice how they outlined them in white for us. Um, um, and these would have been kind of uh, uh, grids where they would have planted uh, crops like maize and irrigated in the Santa Cruz floodplain. So this this was a, this is at Las Capas excavated with, uh, by Jim Vint, um, and this is a incredible find um, um, in Tucson, and Safford and it was done through uh, contract archaeology work I should say, and uh, in in Safford we also have some contract archaeology work that's been done including a project my last project I ran in the early two thousands, 
And we identified uh, very limited exposures in the Safford area, but we, uh, I, I, I identified canals that dated to the early AD period. And then uh, another project, I think run by Tierra right of way, uh, uh, pushed them back into the BC period, not as far back as 1200 BC, but we have a very, very narrow glimpse of what's going on in Safford. We know, do know they're doing irrigation relatively early. Um, this is a very well um, distributed map of canals in the, in the Phoenix area. Um, these are uh, reconstructed um, prehistoric canals. Um, just to give you some scale here, that's eight kilometers and uh, some very, very, de very, very, very de detailed reconstructions of, 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 of these are pre-Hispanic uh, uh, canals. And uh, uh, I think this is probably representing the, the later manifestation of the system. Um, and um, it's something we wish we had everywhere else, including the Safford Basin where we have so, such little data. But you can see there's obviously some very large canals that are going you know, 15 or 20 kilometers. Um, what we do have in the Safford Basin is that the Mormon uh, communities in particular have kept very good records of their historic canals. Um, and um, they even have records of uh, basically uh, in the 1880s when they first arrived, um, basically digging out Ho'okam canals and constructing their first canals uh, um, in, in Ho'okam canals. Um, so uh, this is the Safford Basin again, or Safford. Um, and these are the uh, canal systems today. The dotted red lines are um, extensions. So these are obviously something that, that has been added on, um, 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 you know, after the, the original constructions. But the solid red lines are the original uh, canals uh, built in the Safford Basin in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. And you can see some of them like the, um, what is this, the, uh, um, Oh wait, what is it? The Union Union Canal and uh, the Fort Thomas Canal. Some of these are getting pretty long. There's the scale down there, five kilometers. So we're talking about uh, 15, 20 kilometer long canals. And if we can infer uh, that these early alignments, uh, were they were digging out a lot of Ho'okam canals. This could be more or less the kind of the the, the, the largest uh, extent of uh, pre-Hispanic canal system. It's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a leap, but it's all we have from the Safford Basin right now um, um, in, in the floodplain in terms of trying to reconstruct um, um, canals and canal systems. Um, this is a segment of the Smithville Canal. Um, just to show you, it's basically looking very much like a whole comp canal. It's basically just an earthen canal with no lining or whatsoever. And that's being used still in the, uh, in 2004. I also want to point next, my next slide is to these uh, gridded fields. Um, and this again, goes back to the work by Neely. Um, this is a photograph by Adriel Heise of, 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 of them, um, at least uh, one of the largest groups of them. Um, and uh, uh, William Doolittle and Jim Neely uh, wrote a, uh, uh, a monograph on this and argued largely that they were being used for agave cultivation. So we're above the floodplain where they'd be growing maize. They've got to be growing something else probably up here. So we've got very intensive uh, agave cultivation going on. And these these gridded fields, they're, 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 they're in other places on, on other terraces in, in, in Arizona, but really in the Safford area, they are incredibly dense. Um, um, and uh, this is a, a nice, pretty photo by Adriel, but Jim gave me this photo that shows you the uh, extent of the one of the largest systems. Um, it's going for uh, uh, literally uh, looks like kilometers there, and um, they defined uh, boundaries markers. Uh, uh, so there were boundary markers. Some of them had petroglyphs on them. Um, the dating of the ceramics from the sites or, 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 or scatters in this area largely date to 1000 to 1300, I think, uh, looking at the, the table. But it shows you not only were they probably doing a lot of very intensive irrigation agriculture in the floodplain, but they were intensively using the, uh, the terrace, uh, terraces uh, above the floodplain, especially on, on the north side of, of Safford. Um, we go on the south side, and I'm taking this right from 
of these are these are ripped right out of uh, uh, Neely and Lancaster 2019 uh, their recent uh, Journal of Field Archaeology uh, article. Um, there's um, Safford again over here, and um, so we're looking on the south side. And what they've traced is, uh, and this is actually also fairly unique to Safford, these very long and linear um, uh, canals that are actually coming off the mountain slopes and into the terraces above the floodplain. Um, this is really unique. In fact, um, um, when archaeologists first saw these, they thought they were probably, oh, there's, these are probably just historic Borman canals because there's just nothing like this out there in the pre-Hispanic period. But um, as you can see, there's a lot of sites. These are all sites uh, that are running along these courses of canals and a lot of settlement. And they make a really good argument in that article that these are actually uh, pre-Hispanic uh, canals. And they're really intensively using this area and they're really doing a lot to get water to fields. And they even, the, the, they, they call these uh, hanging canals, but this looks like a trail. Um, But if you walk it, it's actually got a indentation in it. There's there's um, prehistoric artifacts along it. It's actually a canal where they've cut into the bank and then used a berm to, to sort of in a cut and fill process to literally create a hanging canal to go around this this uh, this hill. And there's a number of, of, of instances of this. So if we think about um, uh, how much they're using the area outside the floodplain, um, um, both on the north and south sides of Safford, they've got to be using uh, the floodplain very intensively too, especially during this, uh, you know, by 1300 AD. And if they are, um, I mean, if they're really using the full carrying capacity of Safford Basin, you, uh, if the Phoenix Basin has 30 or 40,000 people in it at, at a maximum population, the Safford could easily have maybe in the 20 or 30,000 range. So let's go with the early period first. First, um, there's some CRM projects that have been, uh, or contract projects that have excavated a few pit houses um, um, in the Safford Basin. Um, but actually very little work has been done for the 700 to 1100 time period where, where people are largely living in pit houses. However, we do have um, 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 ball court information. Uh, ball courts are lo have been long associated with the HOCOM largely developed in the Phoenix Basin region and then spread outward eastward. And you have some of the most eastward uh, ba uh, ball courts in the, in the Safford Basin, including at that uh, Curtis Buena Vista site, that big, large site uh, right where the Safford Basin opens up. Um, um, and um, this is actually a, a, a ball court um, at uh, Reddington Ruin. These are thought to be the bleachers and they play the ball court somewhere, the ball game inside the, uh, the court. Um, this is in a farmyard in, in, in uh, Safford. This is uh, the, the Buena Vista Curtis ball court. A nice shot taken by Henry Wallace there. There's a huge um, um, uh, late, later site, a Salado site that's uh, around this. But this, this is, this is um, probably one of the best places to do agriculture in the Safford area. Nice large ball court, very strong Hohokam signature there. Also, um, Hohokam largely associated with uh, middle, uh, with buff making buffware right on buff pottery using paddle and anvil, anvil man manufacture. Um, most of this buffware is being made in the middle Gila portion of the Phoenix Basin, very centralized production and then trading outwards to other places in the Hohokam region. Um, um, what's interesting is that we have local production in the Safford Basin by at least uh, uh, 1000 AD, suggesting that we actually have Hohokam potters moving in um, from Phoenix into this area. Uh, and, and there's not many areas outside of uh, uh, the Middle Hewlett and the Phoenix Basin where we have this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this buffer production. So we think the irrigation, the ball courts, the the buffer production. This is this is not uh, you know a boundary type of interaction. This is there's a lot of strong Hohokam presence in the Safford Basin. Turning to Mogollon influence, 
there's a, a local uh, uh, tradition of painted pottery early on, um, but they're also uh, getting a lot of pottery uh, from the members area. Um, and um, um, those archeologists who work in the members area uh, describe members as very much a kind of a, a club. You're either in or out. Um, um, and uh, you either have a fair, a fair bit of members pottery or you have none at all. And from what we know, little we know of this early time period in Saff Safford, there is a fair bit of members pottery in this area. You go one valley further east or you go into the San Pedro, very little members pottery. Um, it's made with a coil and scrape manufacturer, very different from the whole com pottery. And we also have um, um, evidence, uh, geochemical evidence that this is made in the Safford Basin uh, by 1050 or so um, um, as well. So it's not only as members being traded from the Members Valley Members Pottery, but it's actually being made in the Safford Basin. So that's a very strong um, um, interaction. Um, um, and a lot of, a lot of uh, archeologists have tried to make connections between Members and Ho Kam, especially early in the, in the classic Members sequence. And um, um, if you're looking for that connection, I think uh, that, that uh, the answers, if they still exist, lie in the Safford Basin. Uh, okay, going slightly later in time, um, this is a, uh, this is kind of like your uh, a variant of your COVID heat maps, but basically it's a, a contour map of, um, of, um, of corrugated density and ceramic assemblages in, um, in Arizona. And uh, just showing a nice corrugated uh, jar from the Robinson collection over here. Um, uh, corrugated ceramics, brown corrugated ceramics, strongly uh, tied to the Mugione and, and especially the Highland Mugione. And you can see the high um, um, densities here. And you can kind of see a finger of corrugated heading into the Safford area and then moving into the uh, San Pedro and then over Reddington Pass into Tucson Basin. We think this tracks actually a migration route of, uh, of, of, of uh, people moving from the Mugion Highlands into Safford. Um, so even more of a connection with uh, the Mugion region. We also think this, this migration route sets the stage for longer distance migration from the Kayanta region. Um, and uh, once they plug, they can they can plug into this network about here and then continue on down. This is just a, a map of uh, of our reconstructed uh, routes of migration from the Kayanta region to the Little Colorado River and then breaking up in some with some groups ending up in um, um, southeastern Arizona. And we've modeled this as a diaspora because this is during the Great Drought in the Southwest. They they don't go back to their homeland. They disperse. Uh, they're an immigrant minority, even in places where they resettle. Uh, but they seem to maintain a persistent identity and maintain connections between uh, themselves after migration. And they both uh, resettle in the whole common Mugion regions. And these red dots are just basically areas where we know there are strong Kayenta presences, uh, are definite Kayenta enclaves. There's probably many more Kayenta in these areas. These are just really the strong cases of enclaves. We're also showing the Phoenix Basin here in platform mounds, which don't make it in the Safford Basin. The platform mounds are sort of the uh, um, um, they're kind of uh, temple-like structures on top of mounds that are largely associated with the Hohokam. And it's interesting, while we have ball courts in the Safford Basin, we don't have, uh, we don't have platform mounds. Um, so let's focus in on the Safford Basin again. And I'm starting to get close here. Um, that's particularly the Goat Hill site. Well, actually, let me just throw out some, some markers here, how, we're, how we track Kayanta migrants. First, they're making uh, something called Maverick Mountain Polychrome uh, in Southeast Arizona. It's locally made here, but it replicates the, almost exactly the decorated pottery they're making uh, in, their, in their homeland, uh, example of Keats Seal Polychrome. Other markers. Uh, Perforated plates. This is a big one for uh, uh, Patrick Lyons and his research. Um, 
He really loves these perforated plates. Uh, they, we, uh, from his research, we know that they're making pots with these. These are base molds for pots. They're unique to the Kayenta region. Uh, after they migrate, they start showing up in southeastern Arizona. And we don't know what the perforations are for, but uh, they are a Kayenta marker. And finally, these, these things called entry boxes, you have uh, a, a, a slab lined hearth at the floor level, and then you have these large um, kind of front deflector slabs or either outside or, or inside the entry. Uh, once again, in the Kayenta region, prior to 1275, they start showing up in Southern Arizona after uh, uh, 1275. So um, these are just two um, um, enclave, possible enclaves. I mean, Mary Hilda is a possibility here um, and, and def definitely Goat Hill um, uh, here, uh, excavated by Kyle Woodson um, in the 1990s. One of the first really strong cases for migration in the southwest uh, um, that was made. And I'll focus on Goat Hill here. Um, this is Goat Hill right here, a nice uh, photograph by Henry Wallace. Um, you can see the moon rising and the sun setting. You can see it's got a commanding view of the terrain all the way to the Gila River. Um, in front of it. It's in a very defensive location. And essentially, this is a map of what's on top of it. It's basically um, a kind of an encampment. And we find this in other Kayenta enclaves as well. They settle down. Uh, they, they, they basically um, build kind of a ephemeral or, or um, not so well built kind of uh, settlement, maybe testing the waters, whether they can settle, it, settle or not there. Then they build a kiva uh, if they if, if, if they like it, and uh, this is a uh, one of this. I think this is the second kiva uh, identified in, in southern Arizona when when Kyle excavated it, um, and um, this is just a photograph of it, uh, the Goat Hill kiva. But this is this has all the markers of the perforated plates, the Maverick Mountain, the entry boxes of a of a Kayenta enclave. So it was really a smoking gun case. Um, I just want to end up by talking about Anna Newsel's research a little bit. Um, um, basically, when the Kayenta are moving in, uh, we see this interval of tensions uh, between locals and immigrants that's expressed on pottery. The, the migrants have their own pottery, the Maverick Mountain Series, and the locals, including those in Safford, have either a, a red on, continue making red on buff or a red on brown pottery. And uh, what her dissertation uh, tracked in her in, in this in, in, in this monograph is the coming together of these groups over a generation or so, and particularly in the Safford area, she sees evidence of isolation early, and then you see settlements that look um, uh, kind of like room blocks and uh, compounds, uh, kind of hybrid architectural forms, and one side of the the, 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 the site has more of the uh, local pottery and, uh, and, and the other side of the site has more of uh, the Maverick Mountain. So you see kind of a, a coming together, maybe a lessening of tensions. Um, and then, so this, this would be the ethnic tensions in the late 1200s. You've got the, uh, the immigrants expressing their identity on Maverick Mountain. And then you've got the local tradition um, with the, the red on browns and red on buffs. Um, as you go into the 1300s, both of these are replaced by a new type of pottery uh, called Salado polychrome, of which Gila polychrome is the early, earliest widespread type in, in Southern Arizona. Um, and um, what's interesting, if we look at um, what's going on in this period, what, from what we have in the Safford Basin, is that what people are coming together, uh, either lo people are aggregating in general, both locals and migrants and locals. Um, Buena Vista Curtis becomes a very, very big site at this time. Um, um, if we go to the area that we know the best were uh, University of Texas and uh, EA, uh, Eastern Arizona College excavated. Um, what you have is Goat Hill going out 
and these are local settlements here and everybody's pretty much moving in the Spear Ranch area. Um, and uh, that includes this settlement um, uh, called uh, Kreider Kiva, which has a Kiva, that's why it's called Kreider Kiva. It has a later type of Kiva right next to Spear Ranch. Everybody seems to be kind of coalescing in this area. So at this point in time, we must, you know, the immigrants and their descendants and the local groups must be getting along okay to do this. Um, Spear Ranch is unfortunately very trashed. It's been very, very badly vandalized. Uh, the EAC report is not published, um, but I should also point out that this area is a real hot spot for Salado polychrome production. Huge uh, geochemical signature and it's being traded uh, to Buena Vista Curtis and other sites that we know about in the Safford Basin. Mary Hilda may also be a Salado polychrome uh, production area as well. So it's interesting that Buena Vista Curtis, the main, we're, we're, the main local center isn't making much slot of polychromes. It's being made here where locals and immigrants are mixing kind of on the margins of, of the Safford Basin. So this is just a picture of the Davis Ranch uh, Kiva in the San Pedro Valley. At, at the, this is a Kayanta Enclave in the San Pedro Valley. Kreider Kiva only exists in notes. And unfortunately, that's, there's, there's really just nothing to, to to show, but it, the, the, the notes and the, and, and the diagram looks a lot like the Davis Ranch Kiva. It's a later type of Kiva than the, the Goat Hill Kiva. And it's likely that the people from Goat Hill moved down next to Spear Ranch and were basically integrated into that community when they started making Salado Polychrome. So I'm wrapping up here. Um, and um, just wanting to point out that the Salado there's a Safford Basin here, is much of a, a part of a much larger phenomenon that we talked about, uh, that, that we've been studying at Archaeology Southwest for a long time. And um, basically linking Salado polychromes to uh, Salado religion. We know that um, the Salado polychromes are, um, are made with ancestral Pueblo, specifically Cayenta technology and style. Um, however, uh, they're being consumed in mass quantities, not only in enclaves, but in these, these settlements that include lots of local groups and, and, and uh, across this entire area. So not only the Safford Basin, we're talking about a, an area that goes from the Phoenix Basin to the Mimbris Valley, and then from the Mugion Rim almost to the uh, well into southeastern Arizona. So a massive area crossing the Mimbris Ohokam region. Uh, it's, it's being produced in many areas, but yet it has a high stylistic homogeneity, which suggests that the ideas on expressed on, on Salado polychrome are very, very, very important. And we've argued elsewhere, and I, I point you to the readings that, uh, associated with the, uh, uh, this talk, that it represents uh, an inclusive religion, a religion that integrated uh, both uh, uh, Mugion and Cayenta groups on one side of the divide and Ho'okam and, and Kayanta groups on the other side of the divide. Um, and uh, a, a very inclusive and integrative uh, religion that's reflected on, the, on these pots.